I don't know. What do you want to review? Don't let me rephrase that. <laughs> what do you want to know? Because what's on the exam? I'm not going to tell you what exactly is on the exam, but um, everything. <laughs> everything. We're done. Let's. <laughs> I like okay. I'm going to make sure everybody gets this. Everything. <laughs> um, should I concentrate on studying? <laughs> what portions of everything should I concentrate on studying when these kids are sitting in school? E, <laughs> e, R. I'm thinking about my donuts. <laughs> yeah, the sugar's kicking in, isn't it? Um, think about it this way. Or here's, here's one way to think about it. If somebody were to come up to you and ask you, What should I know about Old English? Or what should I know about Old English that helps me understand modern English? Everything. Does that help? Okay. <laughs> Everything. Expecting us to memorize the, the conjugation of the verbs and such? No, not to memorize it. Um, if this were a course in Old English, yes, by all means. But because we're looking at the language diachronically across time from its origins all the way up to today, um, I can't make that requirement, or I can, let me put it this way, I can't have that kind of expectation. Um, simply because even though we had four weeks, essentially four, Four weeks, four class periods, I can't remember which. Um, for Old English, that's still too much, okay? But what you should know, for example, about the verbs, verb conjugations, is what can you tell me about the verbs? They're strong or weak. Stronger weak. Okay. What else? How do weak form past tense? All Germanic weak verbs form the past tense with the dental suffix. Pronounced usually to, sometimes spelled with to, like lert. Okay. Uh, in older English stuff, 17th century, 18th century, a little bit earlier, you'll see walked, W-A-L-K-T, okay? Um, so, final T or final E-D. How do, how do strong verbs form the past tense? Change in the vowel, okay? So strong have that thing that we call oblaut, that's the change in the vowel, okay? From present tense, to past tense to past participle, okay? So, is there just one change? Is there just one kind of change? No. There are how many different classes of these? Seven. Seven classes of strong verbs, okay? Each one has its own significant series, okay, of oblaut. Change from one vowel in present to another vowel, I mean, so, for example, which notes do I have? Look at, where is it? After the nouns, look at this page in your notes. So, seven classes. Notice it's not necessarily the case that each of the seven classes, and, and these are just representative verbs for each class, right? There's a whole bunch of verbs in each of that, in each one of those, in other words. Um, when we get to the Middle English period, we talk about, you know, in the Old English period, there are roughly 300 strong verbs. By the end of the Middle English period, there's only about 60 of those left. Or by today, there's only about 60 of those left. 
By the end of the Middle Ages period, half of those die out. Okay, so if there's 300, you've only got seven here. There's a large number in each of these classes. Okay, so you go from the infinitive, that is the unconjugated form of the verb. That's what an infinitive is. It's infinite in that sense. It's not been, it's not been um, bound in any way. When a verb becomes bound, it's bound to what? It's bound by the agent that is doing the verb. It's bound by the subject. So it's conjugated. It's joined with its subject. So the infinitive form, and if this were Old English, I would say, you know, memorize these. And memorize them in two different ways. Memorize them this way, and memorize them this way. Okay? So, be dun bear dun brook on bin dun bear on tread dun far on hot dun fell dun. That's going down this way. Be dun bad be dun be den. That's going that way. So, infinitive, preterite first person singular, preterite fancy for past, okay? Preterite plural, past participle. Be done bad, be done be den. Be done be Notice the pronunciation for the diphthongs. It's not be o done, two syllables. Be a. Be a. Be done be a. Bo done bo den. And I'm kind of ex um, what's the word I want? exaggerating a little bit in some of the pronunciation to make sure you get that. So, you need to know there are seven classes. Do you need to have an example for each one? No, you don't. Know there are seven classes. Know the classes are according to the change in the vowels. That's it. That's what you need to know for that. You don't need to know what those vowel changes actually are. All right? Because we're too compressed. If, again, if this were just a course in Old English, we would have spent a lot of time probably a couple of days, just on this. This one chart. Okay. Where, you know, I'd be sitting there drilling it into you, and then you'd go off and, you know, uh, drill yourself. All right? No, I, I, I understand. Um, but I like to think, because of my ego, I like to think that nothing I do in here is necessarily superfluous. Absolutely. Okay? Um, though I, every now and then I've gone back and rewatched some things and I thought, oh my God, what a. Um, so there is, a, you know, at least some superfluity. Um, for example, if you go back and look at the history of the period, and I'm not saying because it's unimportant or anything, um, but you've got, you know, one, two, three, four, five, almost six pages of these notes are history. That is external history. They're not talking about the language per se, with the exception of the influence of foreign languages, talking about Latin, talking about Celtic, talking about Norse, for example. But most of that is the historical incursion of Latin, Celtic, um, Norse. Do you need to memorize those six pages? No. What do you need to do? You need to pick out what you think and hope that that's what I think, okay, are the, the most significant aspects. For example, Stonehenge circa 1600 BC. How important really is that for the development, origin and development of the English language? It's not at all. The reason I have it there is to give us an idea, is to frame the history. That's the beginning. Okay? Has nothing really with English, but has something to do with the people that were in Britain, roughly 1600 BC. What about Caesar's annexing Britain? Yeah, that's, that's kind of important. Why? That introduces Latin to the island. 
doesn't introduce Latin to English. Why? There is no English at that point. Okay, but it introduces Latin to the Celtic speakers. And how long is Latin then there for? Well, there's another date a little bit later on. When do the quote unquote Latins, Romans, leave? 410 AD. So Latin as a language is spoken in Britain for roughly 450 years, folks. That, that's pretty, pretty long. It's going to have an impact on that culture. Now, again, what is that culture? It's not English. Initially, it's Celtic, but then fairly quickly, it becomes what? Romano-Celtic. Why? Romans are marrying Celts. So Celts are borrowing words in from Roman, from Latin, etc. So then, what's another important date? Okay. Or I said, you know, Caesar invades in 55 BC. Claudius annexes in 43 AD. Still roughly the same. So 410 AD, when the, when the Roman legions leave, that's an important date. Why? What does that create? What does that cause? Germanic vacuum. Germanic invasions a little bit later. What's the vacuum? Why are the Roman legions in 410, why are they still there? What's one of their purposes at least? Who's, who's north? Who's north of that wall that the emperor Hadrian builds in the late first century, very early second century? Maggie? Scots and the Picts. Okay. Why are they so fearsome? Braveheart, you know. Blue, woad, fighting naked, yelling, you know, all kinds of stuff. Okay. So they build Hadrian's Wall to keep them out. Well, once the Roman legions leave, the Picts realize the wall's not a barrier anymore. We can come over. So they leave 410. When do the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes start coming over? 449, 450. Right around those two years. Okay. So why do they come? Do they just suddenly miraculously know, hey, Britain's ripe for the picking because there aren't any Romans there anymore? No, there's that Romano-Celtic chieftain that I referred to, who is mentioned in your textbook, named Vortigern, who essentially sends an emissary, sends a message to the Germanic tribes asking for what? Mercenaries. I mean, this is a lot of good old westerns. This is, you know, the um, Magnificent Seven. He's looking for mercenaries. Why? Because there are bandits raiding his town. Okay, essentially. So the Germanic tribes beginning coming uh, begin coming over. Four forty nine. They don't all just come in one fell swoop in the years four forty nine, four fifty. They start coming in. They're still coming. For 150 years after that. Okay. They come in waves. And after a while, they start to stay. They start to settle down. They then start to inter intermarry with the Romano-Celtic people that are sticking around and not fleeing. So what does, why is that important? Why is the Germanic invasion important for the history of the English language? <clears throat> That's where we get English. This comes from the god Ing. Ing. Okay. Which is the Ang in Angles. Okay. So we get the, you know, the beginning of the Germanic languages coming over them. All right. Well, I said that that's still going on for about 150 years. Well, go 150 years after the year 449, 450, and what year do you have? Roughly 600, but specifically the date that's given in your notes, 597. Why is that important? 
St. Augustine or St. Augustine of Canterbury is sent by Pope Gregory the Great. Okay? Why? To bring Roman Christianity. Why Roman Christianity? Why not just plain old Christianity? Well, plain old Christianity had been there since the second century. But what happened when the pagan Germanic tribes came in? Either slaughtered them or chased them away. Okay. So we hear a story, and I'm going to put it up um, on the that thing in a moment. We hear the story about how Gregory is introduced to a couple of English children. He makes a pun on their names. You're not angels, you are angelus, angels. And because they're angels, they ought to know something about the Lord of angels. And so that's why he comes up with the idea of sending Augustine. Okay, cool. So who's, who comes next? Who's really important after St. Augustine? Bede. And what does Bede tell us about? This person's actually just a little bit before Bede. Cadman, okay? Which you've got Cadman's hymn in your notes. You also have it right here. All right? So a little practice in Old English. How is this pronounced? Exactly as it looks. New. New. Not new. N-E-W. If you're a real stickler, for pronunciation. You, you pronounce that W on new. new. This is just new, like moo with an N. Okay? New. Sh. SC is always sh. Always in Old English. It's because of the influence of Old Norse that almost all of our modern English words that begin with SC are pronounced how? In, even though that's SK. But what happens if you fall off your bike to your skin? What do you get on your skin? Scab. A scab which, from a scrape. Scrape, scab, straight from the bike. So, new shul on, not un. Why? Because those final syllables are still pronounced here. New shul on, carry on, have a richest word. Meh. On his mocha, on his mugula. Where wound your fat is, why he wound your yawah. Ain't your Christian aura still. So, why is this important? Cadman composes this around the year 680, 681. Okay? Big deal. What does it have to do with the history of the English language? Maybe? I see you over there mouthing it. Are you saying something to yourself? Uh, it's like it was after it was first written or first composed. Bede, in his ecclesiastical history, he puts it in Latin. Why? Because his whole book's in Latin. And he tells us this is the gist of it. It's not the real thing. Why? Because the real thing's in Old English. And if you want to know the real thing, you got to learn the language. So if you really want to understand, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables learned French. Okay. That's part of it. What else is it? Look at where Wilder, Wundra, Echa, Or, Ah, uh, Eric, Yelda, Heaven, Prova, Halle, Midden, Mani, Each uh, Actor, Hira, Bolden. Those are all examples of what? Stressed alliteration. Okay. He's the first poet to use his native vernacular, everyday, ordinary, common street language for quote unquote Christian purposes. Okay. Why is that significant for the language? Because that's showing us what is influencing the language. And in fact, almost everything that survives from the Anglo Saxon period is produced by Christians. Produced by means, copied, and preserved by Christians. Now, there's a flip side to that, too. 
That means probably an awful lot of literature. Let me qualify that. Good pagan literature doesn't survive. Why? Because if you're a good Christian monk, you're not going to preserve that good pagan stuff because it kind of goes against your belief system. Though we do have things like Beowulf, all right, which do have some pagan elements. All right. So this is Cadman, about 680. It's the beginning of Christian poetry in English. Long predates Old Saxon Christian poetry by a couple hundred years, or Norse Christian poetry by several hundred years. Iceland doesn't become Christian until the year 1000 AD. Okay. Um, okay, so we get this story told by who again, Trevor? Bede. Why is Bede significant? Kind of. He gives us the history, okay, the church history of England, but it even goes back to before the church, okay. Why else? I mean, Bede's often called the first modern historian because he verifies his sources, he gets eyewitness accounts, he gets double eyewitness accounts, so to speak, but he's also preserving for us kind of at the time. All kinds of information that otherwise we would not know at all. It's Bede that tells us, for example, about the Anglo-Saxon invasions. If there were no Bede, we wouldn't know about how Germanic came into the language. Okay? What else? What other important dates or historical figures, let's say for the Anglo-Saxon period? Have we named any kings yet? How important are kings really, for the history of a language. There are one or two in the Anglo-Saxon period that we will talk about. But in terms of the overall history from the beginning of Anglo-Saxon to now, there's not a lot. Even though in the Middle English period I gave you a whole page of almost just names of kings. Well, that's because of the literary influence, not the linguistic, not the actual language, the literary influence, okay? Here's one, Alfred. Why is Alfred important? Well, mostly literary, partly also language, because Alfred was the one who said, man, our educational system sucks. He said in his preface to a pastoral care, there's almost nobody north of the Umber River. Yeah, I think that's about the language he uses. Who knows any Latin? And hardly any more south of the Umber River. Well, why is knowing Latin important? If you're an Anglo-Saxon, you just want to go around, go about your daily job, find donut country, be able to buy a donut in Old English. How? So why is Latin important? Okay, you have to ask directions, but are you going to ask in Latin? To go to your nearest pub or whatever? No. So what do you need Latin for? Uh, <laughs> okay. Also for church. And church, which is pretty important. Bear in mind. I mean, you can't put a 21st century mentality in 800 AD England. It, it doesn't work. To try to understand this period, you have to try to jettison your 21st century mentality. And mentally, imaginatively, enter a period a time period where everything you do revolves around the church and the church calendar. Okay? So that even the hours of the day are kind of reckoned according to the hours of prayer for the church. Even if you're not a monk. Right? So, Alfred institutes a set of, you know, kind of educational reforms. What else? He has translated into English several very important major books. Bede being an example. Okay. Boethius being an example. A couple of works of Gregory the Great, the guy who's responsible for Roman Christianity coming in, being an example. A history of the world being an example. Why? Because he wanted people who could read and write 
in Old English to be quote unquote educated. For him, that meant know these five books. Five. One of those books was the history of the world, essentially from the beginning to now. It's not, it's not strictly speaking a history of the world. It's a history of the world against pagans. It's got that little you know, jab in there, right? What else does he do? Now, this is important linguistically. Who does he defeat in a big battle? Yeah, you don't have to actually name the guy. Guthrum the Dane, though. He defeats the Danes. What does that stop? Take a look at, you know, take a look at get these all out of order. Take a look at this map. Right here. And If you were to draw a line roughly like that, okay. because of his defeat of Guthrum the Danes, the Danes who were primarily settled up here, but who are still attacking down here, as well as Cornwall, Wales, etc., they're they're moving this way. Okay. When Alfred defeats them, he defeats them way over here. But when he signs that treaty, he gets them to agree. You will stay north of this line. It's essentially from London to um, here, we over there in this black hole is up there. Okay. Every north of that you can have, everything south of that we get. So establishes the day mark. They get that, we get this down here. What does that do? Well, that helps preserve English. West six. Late West Saxon, right? Because if he had lost, <clears throat> we probably wouldn't be speaking English. We would probably be speaking something closer to modern Icelandic or Norwegian. Okay, because, I mean, this is early in the development of the language, right? <clears throat> so, that kind of st stops that foreign infiltration. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, they erect a great big giant wall here and there's no energy. No, there's still cover, no matter who your enemy is. What always happens? You got to trade. You got to buy and sell. You got to bargain. Why? You need bread. They have bread. You have beer. They want beer. So you trade a beer for a loaf of bread. Okay? What do you, you got to be able to talk. Okay? So you've got that going on. Plus, you've got intermarrying going on. That's when, what next, you know, intrusion into the language? Old Norse. Okay. And, you know, how does Norse affect the language? If I were to say on the exam, list I don't know if I have this in the notes. I'm just going to throw it out there and see. List five ways Old Norse affects the grammar of the English language. And if you want to include as affecting the grammar, the lexicon, the vocabulary, let's throw that out as number one. Lexicon or vocabulary. We get all kinds of words, right, from Norse, like skin, I. Egg, sky, scrape, all those sk words come from Norse, okay? So, lexicon vocabulary. One, two, three, four, five. I'm going to count five. So, what are some other ways? <clears throat> Norse affects the grammar. Any order. Doesn't the introduction of the lexicon affect pronunciation? Um... Not really, other than the pronunciation of the words that are brought in, or the replacement of certain combinations in Old English with Viking ones, like ch with k, 
which we can add. But I'd, I'd still call that this. How do we form the present participle today? Comes from Norse. How do we form third person present singular tense of the verb? I, she, uh, he, she, it, pick a verb. Runs. Z, z. Final S ending. Third person singular verb. Remember what it is in Middle English? Depending upon the dialect. North, it's what? Because of Norse. South and Midlands? My cup, according to, runneth over. It's the ev ending, okay? Which is also the native Old English, okay? So, in third person singular, what else? I think pronouns. The TH forms third person plural pronouns. They, their, them. What's the native Old English? He, hera, heom, and a whole slew of varied spellings of those three things. Okay? That's grammar. That's not just, I mean, it looks like it's lexicon. It's not only, however. It also changes the grammar. What else? Plural form, verb, you, he, she, uh, you, you, they, them, they, are. That verb form is from Old Norse. Seems like there's something else I'm drawing a blank on. In the notes. I don't think it's not a drop off. So those are pretty, pretty significant changes. Latin doesn't do that. French doesn't do that. Okay. In French, in a sense, Anglo-Norman French, French in a sense has a greater and longer period of impact on English than Norse does. So why doesn't French? change the grammar, the grammatical structure. A couple of reasons possibly. One, it's not a Germanic language. That is, each of these are kind of natively closer to the Old English than would be the French version of this, or this, or this, or this. What is the French plural for to be? Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, third person plural. It's been so long since I had French. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not even close. Because at least this is close to... Brain freeze, another old, uh, old English one. And I'm drawing a blank. Okay. So, I mean, because they're already related and they're already interchangeable, that's probably one of the reasons these get adopted. Okay. Um, what else? Let's see. What about the year 1066? When's it begin? When's it end? I don't mean January 1st. December December 31st. Well, early in 1066, who dies? Edward the Confessor. Why is, why is his death significant? The domino falls. Edward Confessor dies. He doesn't have an heir. Who gets elected heir? Not heir, but next king. Harold Godwinson who thought 
he would become the next king. William of Normandy, he starts building ships. Okay. September rolls around. Who invades in September? There's a battle on September 25th. Stamford Bridge, which is London's out here, Stamford's up here. Harald Hardrada, Harold Harddeans, is what his name is. And Harold, Godwinson's brother, tossed him full of himself. Right? Harold Godwinson marches north, defeats them. While he's there, word comes, by the way, from down here in Normandy, William has landed down here on the southern coast at Pevensey. Okay. So now, Harold has to march south, and a big, great battle is fought on what day? October 14, 1066. The Normans win the day. Harold Godwinson dies with an arrow in the eye. You don't have to remember that part, but it's a nice little detail, you know, for parties and stuff. Um, <laughs> the French win. William is crowned king when? Christmas Day, 1066. Why Christmas Day? Because he thinks he's Jesus reincarnated? No. Kind of close to that. <laughs> Charlemagne, 266 years before then, was crowned Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope by handing the Pope the crown and essentially saying, hand it back. Put it on my head. Okay. So, that kind of signals, kind of, signals the end of the Old English period. It's definitely the end of the Anglo-Saxon period. Why? Because there aren't Anglo-Saxons in, in control. There aren't Anglo-Saxons ruling anymore. There are French, or Anglo-Norman French, okay? William the Conqueror and such. So, what other stuff do you need to know language-wise for the Old English period? What about pronunciation and dialect? How many dialects are there? What are they? Northumbrian, which is where? Here's the Umber River. North Umbrian, north of the Umber River. Mercian, which is where? It's this whole area. Okay? Mercia is this area. Kentish, way down here. Okay, and what's the other one? West Saxon. West Saxon, which is this area. Okay. Notice the largest of those dialects in terms of space. You know, if this is going to be your red and blue Republican Democrat map, this is the biggest dialect area, okay, by far, Mercia. So, what do these four dialects develop into in Middle English? What's Northumbrian become? They don't call it Northumbrian anymore. Northern. What about Mercia? Midland? East Midlands? West Midlands? Because they're pretty different. In the West Midlands dialect, for example, you have Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, which I'll put a portion up of in just a moment. Okay? It's radically different from the East Midlands dialect of Chaucer, and yet they're written about the same time. Right? What are the other two? So you have Northern, East and West Midlands, Kentish still, and Southern. Right? What else about Old English? See, that's all Middle English. What am I looking at? Uh, let's see, that's history stuff. Map. Nice picture of Alfred. Norman Conquest. Dialect. What about nouns? And adjectives. Verbs have strong and weak. Nouns, 
Nouns have strong and weak. They're gendered. Okay. Pronouns, excuse me, demonstratives are also strong and weak. They're also gendered. What must always match? Adjectives must always match the nouns. And, and notice, adjective really means what? It's a modifier, right? So what falls under adjectives? Definite articles. Demonstrative pronouns. And what else? Pronouns. Pronouns have got to match. You don't say our our shoe. Our shoes. Because two people can't wear one shoe. Unless it's a really big shoe and you got weird feet. Right? So, I mean, those have got to agree in what? Case, which is name the old English cases. Nominative. Accusative. Okay, do that order. Genitive. Dative. What's the last one? It's not used very much. Instrumental. Okay. Vocative, um, which is a Indo-European one, has died out. We still have, however, a modified vocative. Modified. Not because we add something or not because we change the form of something. We add marks of punctuation to indicate vocative. Give me an example. Anybody know of one? Low could be, because there's a comma comes after. Vocative means what? You're calling out. So if you're calling out, what are you doing? You're referring to somebody. The great Latin example, Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. Et tu brute. The comma here in the A ending. He doesn't call him Brutus. Why? Because Brutus is nominative ending. The A is vocative ending. So when I say et tu Trevor A, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> but I would say, in you, Trevor, should, blah, blah, blah. That's indicating that it's vocative. I'm calling that individual out. If notice, if I don't have this, and I'm just speaking generally, then you should all study really, really well everything, everything, everything there is. Just memorize it all. Notice, there's no vocative there. But if I say, and you, Rosalind, should know everything, then I'm calling out. Right? Um, so you have strong declensions, you have weak declensions. Do you have to memorize the forms? And the suffixes? No, you don't. Okay. If this were Old English, you definitely would. Strong edge. What's the difference between a strong adjective and a weak adjective? Louder. What about it? You're... Bingo. That's how you know when you have a weak adjective. It is always. Always, always, always preceded by an article or demonstrative pronoun. You could have strong cat in Old English with nothing before this. Or you could have the strong cat. Just saw Cat Marvel the other night. Flirting, if you're familiar with it. Okay? This tells you what? This is weak. Every time. So if you have an example on your thing, and I put something in Old English, and I give you a translation, and that something is in Old English is strong cat, the strong cat, or I have this indicating modern English, we supply that all the time. Because if you wrote strong cat went to the store, I would say that's not grammatical. 
you need an article in front of that in modern English. You need a strong cat or the strong cat, okay, or my strong cat. Notice, what does that make this? It makes it weak. Okay, why? It is it is a an adjective. Uh, it's an article that's preceding this. It's a pronoun, yes, but it's preceding and it's controlling this. Okay, and in Old English, what? This would take the case that would match this case ending and this case ending. It doesn't mean that they're all the exact same case ending. It doesn't mean this is going to be in and this is going to be in and this is going to be in. Okay, why? Because this particular ending for that noun. Um, let me read, let me redo this. Let's say um, the strong cat ate the mouse. The strong cat is what case? Nominative. That's the subject, right? So this would be the nominative, and let's assume for the sake of argument, this is masculine. So this is masculine what? This has got to be masculine. This has got to be masculine. Okay? So they're all going to be masculine. So this is going to be masculine. This is then going to have the, let's say these are also strong. The masculine strong ending for an adjective. This is going to have the masculine strong ending for a noun, okay? And then whatever else for the rest, okay? So, nouns, masculine and strong. Adjectives, uh, it's weak and strong. Adjectives, weak and strong, okay? Whole bunch of different varieties. Pronouns, weak and strong? No. Okay. But they are complex, much more complex than... Modern English. Let's see. What else in here? Um, I think the only other stuff is I give you examples. Okay. Uh, let's talk about loan words for a moment. What time is it? 8.52. Talk about loan words. Where do... Give me this all mixed up with the Middle English. Where do the... What are some, exa not examples of loan words per se, but what are some languages that loan words into English? French. French? So, French, Old Norse, Latin, Celtic, okay? Does French... Loan words in the Old English period? No. No, it does not. So, Old Norse, Latin, and Celtic. Latin is borrowed by, let's really broaden English. Let's, let's include English on the continent. That is, before it comes over to the Isle of Britain. Latin influences... English in all its development, how many times? There are three periods. Okay. What's the first period? It's the one I just mentioned. mentioned. Continental. Um, how does that occur? Okay, battles between the Roman legions and Germanic tribes in Northern Europe. Okay. How else? Is everything always about war? Isn't there ever peace and love? Well, there is. After the, Ro after the Germans stopped the Romans. Then peace and love break out. How? Well, the Germans borrow words in this period have nothing to do with battle. But they have to do, for example, with this. I doubt most of you would eat out of cardboard boxes at home. What was not brought for you to eat off of? Plates? What's another word? Dish. 
spelled D-I-S-C. However, why? Because it comes from Latin via Greek, discus, okay? Original Olympic Games, you know, throwing plates. Kind of like skeet shooting, but without the shooting, okay? So, what else? If you're going to eat, what do you also have to do? Yeah, I mean, wine, vino. So you're going to eat and you're going to drink at the same time, okay? And if you're really smart, you can eat and drink and walk at the same time. And if you're going to eat and drink or walk at the same time, what are you going to walk on? A street, okay? All three of those are continental borrowings from Latin into German, okay? First century to probably fourth century, something like that, okay? What's the next period? Okay. We're going to put church a little bit later. Um, Celtic, because church is roughly, starts 597. Should this come first? I mean, these two, most people would say continental comes first. Because the Roman legions are going up against the Germans before the birth of Christ. We don't know exactly how soon or how long before that. But Celtic, we know, when does Caesar invade? 55 BC. When is Britannia or when is Britain annexed? 43. What language are the people in Britain speaking when that occurs? They're speaking Celtic. A variety, different variety of the Celtic, but they're speaking Celtic, okay? So you have the intrusion or the influence then of Latin into Celtic. We don't have many words that survive in modern English today from Latin into Celtic. I think there's only two that I include in the notes. And they both essentially mean the same thing, okay? Campus. And then one isn't even a word anymore. It's a part of a word in English place names and American place names. Chaster or caster or R-E spelling, which becomes um, Chester, like Winchester, Chichester, Hampchester, Worcester. Worcester, if you want to pronounce it crudely, etc. So then the third one, that's the church. Okay. Let's see anything else for those. I think that's about it for the old English. Just put this up here for a moment. You've got place names at the end of that. You should, you know, you should have some examples ready of place names from um, Old Norse and stuff. Um, you should probably have an example or two of each of the linguistic borrowings. So Latin, Norse, Celtic. There's only you know a couple of Celtic. Lord's Prayer in Old English, real quickly. Now, I put up last night and sent link. No, I did not email you links to I told you about. On the announcements page for D2L, I put up two different recordings of me essentially reading this. One of those recordings has these G's pronounced one way, and the other one has them pronounced the other way. I don't care which way you, if you're going to do the extra credit, I don't care which way you do it, but do it consistently throughout. So if you do this with what's called the velar G, the hard G, do, forgive, guilt us, forgive us, guilt and do, all the way throughout. For those examples, those are different than this. So, Fader Ure, Huthi Eric on Helenum, Sithi Nama Yahalagor, 
to be come to the reach, the word of the wheel on Erevan, swa swa on Yavre. Un a yada twam le can fa, sur us to die. And forgive us, ur guilt us, swa swa way, forgive us, ur guilt and do. And a yellad to us on costing it. Actilus us o evile, so bleach it. So what's the difference between this and this and this? G-E, G-E in Old English is always pronounced ye. Always, right? It has the palatalized G. So the other one that I put up sounds like this. Why do I do both? Because you'll hear different Anglo-Saxon scholars say this is a palatal because it has essentially a front vowel, ye, ye, in front of and behind it, right? Like this front vowel, ye, ye, pretty close. Um, so I give you both, all right? Two different ones are about 30 seconds each, right? And I extended the deadline for that to a week from today. today. Today's Tuesday, right? Yeah. We're here. Wow. Yeah, a week from today. Okay. Um, and one person sent it to me, and my computer wouldn't open it for some reason. So don't save it as a WMV or WVM or WMD or whatever um, file. Uh, just use your phone and take a simple. Use your camera on your phone to just do a simple video, and that should work in, I think, almost any style, okay? All right. 20-some minutes for Middle English. Um, this over here. All right. Middle English. External history. Kings and all such. So who do these guys are really important? Henry V, why? First one growing up speaking English. Okay? William I, obviously. Dirty rotten French made the spoils of language by introducing French, thus making the spelling, not necessarily the language itself, but the spelling not make any sense. It's because of the Norman Conquest that modern English spelling is utterly chaotic. So who else? Henry II. Henry II, because he establishes the Plantagenet dynasty, which introduces also the whole literary tradition, Arthur and all that kind of stuff. Okay, Not language per se, but an outgrowth of language. Um, John, you got to include Magna Carta. That's pretty important. Right? You know, kind of fosters English nationalism. Edward III, more English nationalism, okay? Edward I, first of those Plantagenets, born in England. Um, Henry V, Henry IV, I'd say probably. These other Henry, except for Henry VII. Why Henry VII? He defeats Richard III. And that's pretty much the end of the Middle Ages and the Middle English period. Okay. So, go from there to some other stuff. And you got a, you know, on this page, you got a bunch more historical information about the Anglo-Norman language, about Middle English, and then you have 2.8. Why is 1250 so important? And you can be sure. Yeah, it's by that period, by that date. 
Okay. Um, French words being borrowed into the English language by native French speakers learning English. The only reason they're learning English is because they have to. See, prior to that, English speakers have got to learn French in order to get by. After 1250, English speakers don't have to learn French anymore. That means English has won the linguistic battle over which will be top language. Okay? So, I mean, that's a, that's a hugely significant date. Okay? Um, what else? So you got a bunch of other stuff there. Okay, so this is fairly important. Why? Because it gives it it starts to show us those doublets. Okay? Like warranty and guarantee, warden and guardian, war and gal, etc. Okay. Some Phonology, pronunciation stuff. <laughs> G-H. Okay. Pronounced <sighs> as in Middle English. <laughs> okay. By the, and I don't think, I don't think I included this in here. And I was thinking about this yesterday. I don't think I talked about it. It's in your book, but I didn't include it in the last one. By the end of the Middle English period, there are some instances where that Old English, just G or Yo, okay, aren't pronounced like that. Okay. And one of the things that happens late Middle English, early, early modern English, is this actually becomes more, can be pronounced more than one way. It's this one letter that gives us, you know, and the vowel that comes before it, that gives us one more. All those different pronunciations. Then I notice. But cough, uff, off, uff, though, through. Notice the GH there and the GH there are both what? Silent. Middle English, this would be the, the, but it becomes silent. At the end of the Middle English, very, very, very end, almost beginning of the early modern English. Can't really date specifically to when that when that happens. Right? So what else? All consonants pronounced, final E's, ultimately become schwa, and then also like this, unpronounced entirely. I mean, by Chaucer's day, they're not pronounced except in except if you're reciting verse. And you have to make that verse scan. Okay? Um, internal history. We talked about Sapir Whorf hypothesis. Why is that significant? Well, that kind of gets back a little bit to why that year 1250 is so important. Okay? Apparently, because French has. Oh, I don't want to say more descriptive language because French has more adjectives for certain things. What does that tell us about French culture? What do, what do a lot of people think about French culture obsessed compared to obsessed with aesthetics? Obsessed with aesthetics? What did you say? Particular. Particular. None of you are using the word I want. Refined. Refined. <laughs> it's refined. And if you want to be refined, what? You spell stuff, you know, like French does. Or today in America, like England does. You put an E on the end of everything. Just wrote, drove by the other day some crappy new subdivision. You know, it's, sorry if you live there. I don't mean 
It's like something like Braxton Park with an E. What? <laughs> they don't put an E on the park word park in England. I've been in England 20 times. They don't put an E anywhere on the word park. Okay? Unless, you know, your last name is Parker. Utterly ridiculous. Okay? And, and, and these are... These are not, you know, four hundred thousand dollar homes that you want to, you know, add that kind of thing. So, what else? Um, far away from Latin. Okay. Here's another important little, real important little statistic. Might want to commit that that to long term memory. Years twelve fifty to fourteen hundred, the years of greatest French borrowings. During the Middle English period, over ten thousand words. Or borrowed, and we use over 75% of those today, probably on a daily basis. Okay. Some of you, I'm sure, you know, put on items of clothing, you're using French. You're putting on French clothing. Okay. Um, curtailment of Old English means the word formation. Your book goes into a lot more detail than this does. Because okay. these are just, you know, Kind of abbreviated forms. Diminishing of Old English suffixes, Latin French, suffixes and prefixes. Replace the native Old English ones. We almost always use in, I in, something, rather than un, something. Un is native Old English. In, like inactive, we don't say unactive. We say inactive. In is Latin. Um, this pretty much true. I it, it, probably, if I ever teach this course again, um, I'll probably have to put a footnote or an asterisk or something there and say, you know, something like up until the 20th century. Because what did we, how, what's one phrase you could use to characterize the 20th century? I mean, you have the Age of Enlightenment, right? And then you have the Industrial Age. What's the 20th, 20th century? Military. Technological age. Okay. What happens with that rise in technology? We'll see this when we get to that period. We start creating all kinds of words. You know, what's this thing right here on this computer called? Ooh. Keyboard. Really? That's a key. I don't see one of those there. Why isn't that called a button board? Because they look more like a button or a tapping board. Why is it a board, too? Because it's, is this a long board? Is this a sitting board? No. But if you go someplace and somebody pays for it, what do they pay for? Your room and that's what the board refers to. Okay? Chaucer's in Chaucer's Knight's Tale, or in the general prologue, the knight's son, we're told, carves before him at board. That is, he carves up his father's meat for him. It's not because he's senile, it's because he's showing, you know, respect for himself. Okay? Spelling innovations. Yeah, you ought to memorize all these. You really ought to know these. Okay? Um, not necessarily like the Middle English example. Every single one of these, but you ought to be able to go across and if there's a chart, fill in those blanks. Why? Because this is one of the things that screws people up so much about English, right? How, why? How can we spell fish according to what George Bernard Shaw said? Because of the influence of French and Latin. T-I as in shun. How do you get sh from T-I? How do you get sh in Old English? Always and only. Yes. Always and only. You never have S-H in Old English as sh. There it would always be s. Always it would be that, okay? So, pronunciation, sh, spelled with a C, 
Middle English spelling. Why? Because they hear that ah sound with the sh. And so they start throwing in H's, okay? On down the line. Uh, not a lot of time left. Let's see, what else? Let me skip going through all this individually and go to, okay, dialectal characteristics we'll go over in a moment. Go to this page where you have this. A summary of changes. What does that really mean? If I'm summarizing it for you, what am I really doing? You should probably know this. Okay. So, 1250, watershed year, areas of borrowing, government, religious, cultural, military law. Well, above that, you have a whole bunch of borrowings in government terms, religious terms, cultural terms, military terms, legal terms. You might want to know some of those for each of those terms, okay? Demise of Old English ingenuity for word formation. I give you three different examples. Spelling innovations. That was that previous big chart. Some sound changes we've talked about, okay? Leveling, with, leveling of inflections. How does this occur? Okay. Notice, three stages. Anybody remember? Who's not looking at your notes? Just curious. Final syllables ending in something become final syllables ending in what? Final syllables ending in m become final syllables ending in n. So you um becomes you un. And then what happens? That final vowel, if it's an unaccented syllable, gets reduced to schwa. That's the second stage. So Huzan becomes Huzan. And then what happens? Third stage, n drops off. So Huzum, Huzan, 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 Huza, modern English, Hus, house. We'll talk about the vowel change starting next week. It's the great vowel shift which is the other thing that just screws up <laughs> pronunciation and everything. And we can't blame that on the French. We don't know why it happens. Nobody knows why what's called the Great Vowel Shift occurs. Okay? Why is this after this? Why is it this five, loss of radical gender, six, leveling of inflections? What do the inflections carry? Gender. The inflections are telling you what? About a noun. Case, number, gender. You remove those inflections, what do you have? None of those. How do we indicate number today? Throw an S. Make it plural, right? Okay. So, you get rid of this, you get rid of this. You get rid of this, and you have this developed. Because if you can no longer tell what a word is in a sentence, that is, what its case is, what its function, because that's what case means. What's its function in the sentence? Is it serving as nominative, subject? Is it serving as accusative, direct object? Dative, indirect object? Genitive, possessing something? Okay. If you can't tell what that is by the word itself, how do you know what it is? Analytical syntax, word order. Okay. Pronoun simplification. Notice definite articles and demonstratives. Now, those do simplify, but also what becomes important as a result of both this and this? Let's go before this. And then I don't have it on this summary, but it's above in the notes. If, if word order becomes all important, what else becomes important? Do, do you just say modern English? Let me rephrase that. Modern standard English. I go store. You, Jane, me, Mary. No, you don't. Tarzan doesn't even speak like that. What do you do? 
I go to the store. Why? Because what are these now doing? What have they taken the place of? Those cases right here. Does this make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Some people think that this is what the English language is heading towards. That we will start to drop off these prepositions. Because this makes perfectly good sense. I go store. I buy milk. I eat dinner. But it also kind of sounds like what? Mm, me caveman. <laughs> you know, uh, we start dropping those things off. And it, yeah. Or I've had students write papers using text ease, literal papers, upper division. And I'm like, what the hell? This isn't a cell phone. Use proper English, you know? So, pronoun simplification, yeah, they do get simpler, right? Go back and look at the old English for these, and then look at the late middle English. Late middle English becomes what? What are the, what's the definite article? What form does the, the notice? The tells you what? There's only one. The definite article becomes the. Old English, it was what? Say, say, fast, that. All the way down the line. You had seven or eight different forms, okay? Verb simplification. Well, Old English has over 300 strong verbs. By the end of the Middle English period, over half of those die out. By the time you get to today, fewer than 60. They keep dying. They keep dying. Pretty soon, they'll all be replaced or turn into weak forms. Okay? Conjugations also simplify. New dialect areas, which you've talked about. And then I gave you all of these... Lists of kings and such, and you have some examples of poems. Um, and I said, and I left about as much time as I did the other day, I said we would take a look at this poem. Not because that's anything to do with the exam. This has nothing to do with the exam. I just think it's really cool. Earth talk of Eartha, excuse me. Ertha talk of Ertha, Ertha with law. Ertha all the Ertha, call the Ertha draw. Ertha lie the Ertha, and Ertha the fraud. Go have the Ertha, or the Ertha, Ertha in all. Earth took of or from Earth, Earth with. Now the gloss is wrong, but it can also be woe, because that's it is the form that we get woe from. Earth, other earth, to the earth drew. Earth laid earth, that E-I, diphthong, by the way, that's new in Middle English. You didn't have that in Old English. Earth laid earth in earthen throw, okay, grave, then had earth of earth, earth enough. What is earth referring to? Man? Man took of man, man with woe. It's one of the meanings. Okay. Man is one of the meanings. Man took of man, man with woe. Well. Hmm. What might the first one be? Get it, go all sexist. Maggie? You want to? Earth, earth. What? According to the biblical story, what are we all made of? Dust. We're just dust. We're just mud, right? So, mud took of mud, mud with woe. Biblical creation story. What was created from mud, other mud? Woman was created from man. So, earth took of earth, earth with woe. Earth is this woman taken from man earth, what? Earth, part of him, with woe, with Wrong with sorrow, possibly. Earth, other earth, to the earth drew. Let's start ascribing things to it. Earth, uh, 
an earth person, another earth person, to the earth drew. What is it, to the earth? Okay, it could be drawn to each other. What else could it be? To the grave. This earth drew this earth to the grave. How? Ooh, look at that apple. Earth laid earth in earthen grave. Then had earth, not this one, but probably this one, of earth. Then had Adam of Eve, Eve enough. Or enough what, etc. Right? It's a little four-line poem. You could literally write a 20-page paper on that by going through all the different meanings of the word earth just through each line, right? Especially when you have uh, like this one, okay, and this one where there's all kinds of multiple meanings. All right, other questions since we only have no time left. Bonus materials from the last test. Bonus materials from the last Bonus test. Questions. Oh, you mean like extra credit? Yeah, from the test before. Um, I don't know if it'll be from, from the test before. There'll probably be, well, it won't be straight from the test before, if that's what you mean. Um, there might be some extra credit from earlier material. There'll probably be some extra credit from stuff that I think you really ought to know for this period, but I don't want it to put on the actual exam as counting because it might be, even for me, a little too nitpicky. You're welcome. Take a donut before you leave. Or five. <laughs>